Uh, welcome back uh, for the next uh, session here of uh, our CEO Investor Forum. Uh, delighted to introduce Gary Guthart, who is the CEO of Intuitive Surgical. Uh, really one of the top four on a market cap basis within the industry uh, and really kind of you know, helping us to really provide a perspective on his business, their future plans here as, uh, as, as we uh, move this forward. Uh, Gary actually uh, grew up in the Bay Area, uh, worked at NASA early right out of school, uh, was part of that famous Stanford, SRI now, but Stanford Research Institute, and since 1996 has been the uh, been at uh, that uh, Intuitive. So we're really delighted to have him here, uh, the CEO, and a company who's really made some incredible progress and innovation within the field and space. So uh, please, uh, let's give a round of applause for Gary as uh, through the plans. Morning. <clears throat> delighted to be here with you today. Um, we will have some forward-looking statements. I encourage anybody uh, to go to our website, the investor page of our website, and look at our SEC filings. I, I want to start with um, a specific example and kind of motivate us as to what we're doing and why. Um, so we'll start with lung cancer as an example. Uh, for those of you who are uh, in the field, uh, one of the major procedures that physicians use our systems for is prostatectomy, prostate cancer surgery. If you look at five-year survival for prostate cancer, you see it over the years has come to about 98%. Now, it's, it's risen a lot over the last 30 years. But if you look at lung cancer, the five-year survival of lung cancer, about 24%, so a substantial difference. And I think for all of us as a community, a healthcare community, the real question is, how do you drive that up? What's that going to look like? Quite a different procedure <clears throat> and disease state than prostate cancer has been. Just to take a couple of anecdotes, and these are uh, real patients, um, both similar, and, and they're anecdotes, not, it's not a large cohort, but both 78-year-old prior smokers both had um, suspicious lesion in the lung, no, no, prior, no prior cancer. First patient in 2015, CT identifies a suspicious lesion. It's kind of at the periphery of the lung. It's a ground glass opacity. And the standard of care here is keep coming back for CT scans every three months and let's see if it grows. And so that happens. It takes, takes five of those events, 15 months. Looks like it's growing. There's an interventional thoroscopic procedure to go see if it's cancer. It is indeed cancer. It gets converted into a, lap, a, a VATS, video-assisted thoracic procedure at that time. Remove part of the lung. That patient stays in the ICU for six days. Uh, finally gets home. It's kind of a rough ride and then starts to recover. In about 30 days is is back on her feet and moving. Patient two, same kind of setup, 2021, CT scan identifies a suspicious lesion. Uh, patient is scheduled for uh, uh, ion bronchoscopy. I'll talk about ion in a minute. Uh, navigates the lung, so it's navigated robotically controlled catheter, takes a, a sample of that tissue. Uh, there's real-time pathology done. In other words, rows, it comes out. Uh, in 20 minutes, they know that it's cancer. Patient receives a uh, Da Vinci-assisted thoracic procedure. She's in the hospital for 48 hours, goes home. The entire journey on the left side was 18 months. So you're, you're concerned it's cancer. Is it indeed cancer? And it keeps going. And in the other side, the whole thing is resolved in, in a matter of weeks. And it's rare. It's rare in healthcare to change the, the, the journey by an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 in terms of that experience. And, Patient one I know well, patient one is in my family. And that was the standard of care. And, and she's recovered, but it was not an easy journey. So I think for us, what, what drives us, our, our mission is really a simple one. And it's, it's quite clear, it has been since the company was founded. We think minimally invasive care matters a lot. We think that there are technologies and human beings who can bring enormous benefit to the care cycle. And we think we can help patients get back to what matters most. Um, for, for any of us who work in the field, as you double click on outcomes, you see enormous variability. Uh, there's variability amongst the patient population, there's variability amongst care teams. The closer you get to it, the more disturbing it is, frankly. And if you go through it yourself as a patient or your family members do, you get an upfront look at how much variability we have. So our vision is, is to help this be profoundly better, not a little bit better. Um, identify these issues early, have smooth and integrated pathways to get them resolved. And we think we can do that. We've been at it for 25 years now. Uh, 
as, as was said, we're, we're on the fourth generation of our DaVinci products and continue to, to work and explore. We've also brought new platforms to the market. We measure ourselves carefully. We are a, a heavily quantitative organization. We, we, we believe in measurement. So what are we trying to do? Uh, this is the, the, our customer's language. We think the quadruple aim is right. Better outcomes, we want to measure that and, and demonstrate through evidence that we can do it. Better patient experiences, some of the things that we just talked about. Better care team experiences, one of the huge things that's a challenge in our field, uh, often underappreciated, is uh, what it takes to bring advanced technologies into operating environments and have the care teams actually want to use them and, and uh, benefit from them. It's incredibly hard. The, the interactions around user interface and human factors are intense. Uh, and lastly, I think you've got to demonstrate economic evidence that uh, it's lower to total cost to treat per patient episode. And I think we've done a lot to show to advance that cause and show that it is indeed true. Um, just total experience, this is end, end of 2021. We'll update this here shortly in January, but um, there were a million and a half da Vinci procedures performed uh, in 2021, 3,000 journal articles published on our peer reviewed journal articles published on our technologies. Um, we have uh, placed 1,300 systems in that year. The total experience now of da Vinci uh, surgeons or care teams is over 10 million. Um, there are about 30,000 peer-reviewed journal articles on the use of our products, and, uh, and the install base now is over 7,000. In the third quarter, 20% uh, procedure growth, so our kind of leading indicator of health of the business is how often uh, care teams use our products. Uh, install base growth of systems grew 13% in the quarter. Utilization, so per system, uh, procedures per system per year grew 7% year over year. We have about 80% recurring revenue, so the capital side is not the dominant part of our finances in 305 systems placed. If you just kind of look out uh, what the procedure trend has been through the pandemic, uh, it's about a 15% compound annual growth rate through the pandemic to match that 20% in Q3. So it's starting to come back out. You've definitely seen a wave go through. There's no question that patients uh, deferred diagnostic procedures in the pandemic. It's just coming back up to par levels now, so kind of levels that were like 2019. That means there's a bolus out there. It's kind of a tragic thing. Uh, these are folks who needed diagnoses. They didn't get them. They will have advanced disease. They will ultimately come back into the to the healthcare system, um, past experience in 2012 when there were some changes to diagnostic codes show that that plays out over a couple of years, not over a couple of weeks. Um, but, but those folks will have to come back in. State of their disease, I, I don't know, but in general it will be harder, uh, harder for, that, for that population. Uh, here's what our revenue hit trend has looked like. Um, again, kind of uh, pressure under the pandemic and then recovery. Um, ION, so this is our flexible catheter system. Uh, first indication is uh, diagnostic bronchoscopy for uh, biopsy, install base on the left, and, and utilization on the right through Q3 of uh, this year. And you can see a nice ramp. It's early, uh, but uh, our, our customers and physicians are seeing value here. We're quite excited about it. I think it's driven by uh, great outcomes. We just presented that data at CHESS, the CHESS conference. And I think the outcomes are repeatable in, in the hands of, of other uh, teams, not just the, the teams that studied it. And I think that's the, that's the indication of the thing that will drive this adoption. That's what drives the growth. Uh, single port system, SP, continues to advance. Uh, we saw 46% procedure growth in the quarter. Uh, SP is limited in the US by the indications we have. We're working through uh, new indications with IDE trials in conjunction with FDA. Um, that has been different. Uh, that pathway has been a little bit different than it had been for our multi-port systems in the past. That is what has slowed, slowed this ramp a little bit relative to prior products. Uh, in different regulatory environments or umbrellas, like in Korea, it has actually adopted much faster because it has more indications. So we're quite enthused about this um, platform. We think it's bringing real value. Um, we're working through the, the regulatory pathways. <clears throat> Just kind of zooming out, the, the prompt for the session was a little bit long-term plan. Why don't we talk about the problems we're trying to solve? I think that is what drives us. I think there are three main categories. The first one is we want to raise um, the performance of, of care teams in the OR, the, the, what's happening actually at the tissue level. and We're working on capabilities and technologies that will help that. We want to make sure that we can make high-quality minimally invasive surgery more accessible and 
applicable across a broad population of surgeons and patients. Um, that's harder than it looks. Uh, if you look at variability amongst care teams, you see factor of two differences in complication rates. Uh, you see uh, large differences in adoption of new technologies, and that has a lot to do with the ease of implementation. And lastly, we want to make sure that our hospital customers gain efficiencies when they use it. Uh, and we're seeing that. Actually, here in the pandemic, you might wonder, um, as hospitals were pressured to care for more patients or uh, their finances got pressured, did they walk back from advanced technologies? And the answer to that was no. Um, you know, we watched that and said, okay, are they going to lose conviction? And the answer is they leaned in. They didn't lean out. And if you spend time with, a, with the hospital executive suite and ask, why did they do that? Why did they lean in? It's twofold. One of them is they're getting the outcomes that they talk about, and they don't want to go back to inferior outcomes. It's actually a point of pride. They find it offensive to feel like they're going to ration the quality of care because they're under pressure. So that's one. The second one is that technologies like ours reduce the, the staffing burden on the care of the patient after the procedure. They go home healthy, there's less rounding on them, you need less nursing staff. So actually they leaned in, they didn't lean out, and we continue to see that, which is quite exciting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the things we're doing to raise capabilities in the OR. Um, the two big things we wanna work on is, can you see more? Can you see through uh, tissue surfaces? Can you identify the things you wanna take out and the things you wanna leave alone? Um, this is not my phrase, it's borrowed from somebody else, but I like it. Uh, think of it as smart spray paint. Can you light up the things? that surgeons need to either take out or leave alone. And we think technologies exist to do that. The other one is this issue of variability. How do you help people uh, become more consistent? Um, how do we make sure that, that all the surgeons, if I use the tennis playing analogy, everybody can hit it as well as Serena can hit it? Um, we're gonna work on both of those things. I think there are real opportunities to do both. Uh, we have a fluorescencing imaging platform. We call it Firefly. It uses a contrast agent called ICG. It's been around for a long time. There are other imaging technologies and there are other contrast agents that we're working on that we think can bring this idea of smart spray, spray paint into the fore. Um, uh, AI and analytics are, of course, uh, something that's capable. We have a product called Intuitive Hub, which is smart computing embedded into the operating room. <clears throat> think of that as, as a flight recorder. So if you can record what's happening in the procedure and then do analysis on that, uh, set of data and imaging. It's tightly integrated with our DaVinci systems. We think we can generate insights, and we've shown that we can. Uh, there's um, image integration, the idea that you have preoperative images virtually every uh, cancer procedure that is surgical procedure that's being done in the United States has a 3D image generated prior to that case, but it's uh, often not used in the case. So can we segment that set of images and bring it to the surgeon's uh, field of view while they're doing the case itself? Uh, and there's uh, the ability to feed back these learnings into the learning cycle. Uh, we use virtual reality uh, training uh, uh, thousands of times a day. Uh, it is now fully embedded and has been for the last five or six years in the training curriculum for uh, the company. And you can start closing a training loop, which is, hey, I see what you're doing. I see what you're struggling with. Why don't you do this training? Uh, we're working through that. Uh, we're in the early stages. It looks quite good. A little bit on fluorescence imaging. This has been around for a while. Um, uh, like I said, the contrast agent has been around for 50 years, but it has been adopted in uh, either uh, half or more than half of procedures done on our devices routinely. It's not sort of, kind of, maybe. It is now fully integrated as part of workflow. People are quite enthused about it. What else can we do? Well, one of the complications that folks have in a gynecologic procedure is injury of the ureter. You're not you don't want to injure the ureter. It's hard to see it if you do it. If you do injure it and it scars, you can create kidney damage later. So you actually want to light up the ureter and say, don't touch this. Uh, competitive ways of doing it now are stents. They, they put lighted stents up into the ureter, so it's a mechanical solution. This is a molecular solution. You, you uh, inject a contrast agent and then light it up with a fluorophore, and you can uh, image the ureter in real time. Uh, this has gone through uh, phase one human clinical trial. It is not uh, FDA cleared yet. We're working through the next phases, but it's exciting, and it's a straight-ahead um, idea. It's a simple thing to describe. Now, it's a drug. It has to go through a drug approval process, but we're excited about it. Well, how about prostate cancer? And you know, Likewise, you want to see uh, prostate cancer lesions. 
And it turns out that in prostate cancer surgery, the, the positive surgical margin rate, the likelihood that a surgeon leaves some cancer behind, uh, give or take, the average is about 30%. So in roughly one out of three men who get a prostate cancer surgery, they'll find uh, when they take the, the prostate out, look at the edge of the tissue under a microscope, that some cancer is at the capsule, is at the edge. What that means is that you've cut the cancer in half. You've left some in, you've taken some out. That patient, that person gets a phone call that says, hey, there's some residual disease and either we're gonna monitor it, maybe it's not clinically relevant, or we're gonna bring you back in for adjuvant therapy, you're gonna get something else to clean that up. It's a horrible workflow, that's not a phone call any of us wants to get, so how about we light up the cancer and help the surgeon in real time dissect it? This has also been through a phase one clinical trial, it's also working through its way into the next phase, not yet 510K cleared, but um, stunning. And uh, the, the surgeons who are using this or have been in the clinical trial are uh, shocked with what they see in, in a good way. So can you find the boundaries of uh, the tumor itself? Can you find residual disease? And can you do something about it before you leave the patient? So this looks really interesting and exciting. It's just another step on the pathway that says, how do we drive better outcomes? How do we bring technology to bear to do something? Uh, I was talking a little bit about preoperative imaging and the ability to use that to help plan the case and use it during the case. Uh, we have some uh, clearances here. This model you're seeing is actually not part of our clearances. This is a colon model, but we have clearances for a kidney model. The ability to take the preoperative scan, upload it to the, to the cloud, do some segmentation or machine learning to create anatomical structure, port it back to a portable device for the surgeon to evaluate prior to the case, an iPhone or an iPad. Um, that can be reviewed with the care team and it can be reviewed with the patient before the case. And then it can be ported into the console of our system during the case. Um, and you can do various things. You can manage that image in various ways during the case. <clears throat> Pretty awesome. So it improves confidence, allows for navigation. Think, think of it as, as uh, Google Maps in real time for what you need as you're, as you're navigating. On the other side, uh, how do we look at variability and start to do something about it? Uh, I talked to you a little bit about uh, our in-room smart computing platform. We call it Intuitive Hub. It's a, a smart touchscreen. Uh, it starts with media management. It's integrated with our system so that it actually starts doing uh, video annotation during the case. It actually starts to auto annotate. For those of you who are interested in AI and, and machine learning, when I say the words annotation, um, uh, data isn't very useful if you don't know what it is. You actually have to have high quality curated data. One of the things that Hub does is organize for our customers this kind of data, but it also starts to auto annotate it and it integrates it with our surgical platform, something that's extremely hard to do if you don't have an Internet of Things surgical robot in the room. Uh, that creates uh, opportunities for our customers to do evaluations, to understand surgical performance, to look for sources of variation, some of the things we're gonna talk about later. So it's a fantastic data platform. It also is a fantastic uh, case review tool for our customers and feedback has been really good. I talked a little bit about uh, virtual reality. Um, for, for us, this is uh, neither new nor futuristic. It is part of our normal workflow. Um, this is used uh, for hundreds of thousands of hours of training. You talked a little bit about NASA, something we know well. Uh, flight simulation has been around for a long time. Surgical simulation is becoming a par for the course. What's interesting for us is to connect it through our ecosystems, not just that you have it. It's that it gets integrated into the digital ecosystem and the digital life of our customers. It allows them to track their own progress against their own set of goals. And as time goes on, to be able to feed back what we're seeing in the real world with what they're doing in their training environments. Finally, with regard to efficiency gains, um, there's a, a data connectivity, there's an invisible web that's important to construct underneath all these operating environments to allow for the quadruple aim to really be realized. So preoperative integration, we work with hospitals and create data sharing agreements for electronic medical records. These are patient data identified, but they give us a chance to look at the performance of their uh, surgery programs as a whole and to make comparisons between uh, different approaches, open surgery, laparoscopy, uh, robotics. They can compare between different surgeons and different care teams for an integrated delivery network, an IDN. They can compare between different hospital sites. And they can extract uh, best practice and differences using their own data. We will help them do that. It's a collaborative effort. It's been done now 
thousands of times with our customers. It's a routine part of our exercise. That data then for things like the, the uh, imaging that I just showed you can be brought into the operating room and then summarized and, and analyzed post-op both in um, an app, we call it the My Intuitive app. Think of it as Surgeon Fitbit, the ability to look down at your phone after a case and review in real time, updated how all that went. Think of it as your exercise report. Um, uh, hospital administrators can do likewise, pull up real time dashboards on their, on their PCs or their laptops and look at the real time performance of their surgical program. So as you start to knit this all together, it's not fancy, it's actually not hard to describe, it's incredibly powerful. Um, it gives you real-time insight into the workings of your program. We find that this helps them understand and improve cycles of learning. Um, so we're invested there. Uh, that means that we have a cyber secure, privacy compliant, secure, and, and well-designed backend. Um, this is the stuff that's below the tip of the iceberg. Um, it, it often, it's formaldehyde. It puts people to sleep when you talk about it. It turns out incredibly important to the running of a program. Uh, what that does in the end is, is allow us uh, to be data partners with our customer base. Uh, it's now uh, fully embedded into our, into our practices, into our ecosystem practices. We've continued to invest in it and we'll continue to do so. What does that look like? That means that we want to deliver an ecosystem that allows the, the hospital or our customer to get the results they want, the quad aim. Um, as you think about others entering the space, uh, it's not really robot versus robot. I, I think that is an easy thing to glom onto. It's actually not the way that hospitals will make decisions. They will make decisions based on which ecosystem can deliver the quadruple aim in a program that makes sense. They get the outcomes they want, they get the satisfaction they want, and they get the, the economics that they want. To do that, you need the products, uh, you, you need the things that are supporting everyday cases, you need training and you need the team of human beings that can help them deploy into their environments to make it happen. If you kind of look at, well, what is that? Thank you, it's kind of conceptual chart. What's real? Uh, this is what it really looks like. Uh, in 2021, uh, we invested in R&D a little bit more than 670 million. We've grown our R&D over time. Uh, we think these things are uh, powerful and important. And uh, the devil's in the details. You, you actually have to deliver these products, they have to work. Uh, and we think that their expression uh, has driven the growth that I showed you earlier in the, in the presentation. Um, we, we talk about this being early in the opportunity, and I truly think it is. I, I think uh, adoption of systems like ours, robotic-assisted surgery systems and interventional systems, are in their early innings. Uh, I think we're not uh, near the halfway point. Um, I think that the, the data, the maturity of the technology and the facility of our customers with our products is really actually uh, starting to build momentum. And the, the point of this chart is um, essentially talk is cheap. I, I think the ideas are easy to describe, but the reality is, is an enormous amount of work and discipline to deliver. I think that opportunity for us remains. And thank you with that. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Okay, you've got a few questions. Um, what is your view of the entry of Medtronic's Hugo on the market? Yeah, I, there, there are, I won't speak uh, to one company in particular, um, just a little bit of background. If, if you go out over the last uh, 25 years since we've been running the company, there has been, uh, give or take 25 companies that have brought robotic assisted technology to the market in some form, whether it's orthopedics or soft tissue like ours or or spine. Uh, of those 25, five of those product lines still exist somewhere in somebody's hands and 20 are gone. Um, today, there are probably 100, maybe 150 uh, technology groups somewhere working on this kind of combination of clinical understanding, a technology enabled ecosystem that uses specific imaging, uh, mechatronics, uh, real time computing, little cloud computing. It's a vibrant space, and uh, I think folks are going to come uh, explore it because it makes a ton of sense. I, it's not a, not a big mystery. It is a capital-intensive, extremely detail-oriented uh, effort. It is remarkably expensive and complex to deliver. And uh, as a result, I think some of these teams will succeed, and, and some of them will pass by the wayside. As I think about competition more broadly, I, I think in three buckets. The, the first one is actually competition for 
a patient's choice in a disease state. And so a patient gets diagnosed with cancer, prostate cancer, or uterine cancer, or lung cancer, and they have choices, and those choices will be do nothing, watchful waiting, immunotherapy, radiation therapies, HIFU, um, uh, all sorts of things. And that is actually the most important core economic competition intuitive will face, because that if, if there's a beautiful new immunotherapy, if HIFU winds up to be incredibly effective, that will change how patients make decisions. And a lot of what you saw in my presentation doesn't talk about feature-based change, where we're gonna use a flat screen that wears glasses instead of a 3D console, some of the things that our competitors talk about. I, I don't think those things are particularly complex, I don't think they're particularly impactful, and I don't think they change the outcomes at all. So that category, let's make sure that we're advancing quality of care. That's my number one priority. Number two, there are competitors who uh, look like us, who will create systems that, uh, but for the paint colors, try to do more or less the same thing. And, and we pay attention, that's in our periphery, but, but we don't obsess on that in the sense that we've got a, a fair amount of uh, capability. We're on a fourth gen and we keep working on additional generations and the things we do are hard. So they're gonna have to go learn those lessons. Um, they're gonna have to build volume. Uh, they are a disadvantage relative to some manufacturing scale, so some things that are strong for the company in that. And the third category are similar approaches to disease but different architectures. So something that looks physically different, doesn't look like the kind of platforms we have. And sometimes those are interesting collaboration opportunities. In the case of early companies, they may be groups of teams we want to invite to join Intuitive, and, and sometimes they can be competitors, and we're open-minded to all of that. So Medtronic's Hugo is, is one of the category in the middle. It's, it's quite similar in terms of what it, it intends to do with products on the market, and they gotta work through their Gen 1, and they're a capable team, they're smart people in the world, they have enormous uh, ge geographic reach, and we will see them in the market. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a multi-part question here for you. You decided to expand your installed base of DaVinci through leasing. Could you go back on that decision? Is it to respond from pressure from competition or is it the hospital's capacity to pay? And how do you see the share of leasing versus capital buying in the future for Intuitive? Yeah. So uh, on lease, and there are various uh, ways that we set up leases for hospitals. Uh, the very short answer to that is we, we are happy to give choice to our hospitals however they want to do it. Some. Some hospitals would prefer to buy. They, they uh, would rather carry it as depreciation on their books. Uh, they have the cash, they have the commitment, and they're fine. There are other folks who, uh, for whatever reason in their capital structure, would prefer to lease. That's okay with us, too. In the early days of the, the longer answer, in the early days of the company, um, selling a system was important from the point of view of just what our balance sheet looked like. As the company was small, it was unprofitable, and, and cash in the door mattered. Uh, as we've gotten bigger and our, and our balance sheet is, is healthier, we can extend more flexibility, and we've wanted to do that. If you think about leasing as a strategy, um, in general, it means that you want to, it's, it's easier for us as a company to bring new technologies into a leased portfolio, but it's also easier for competitors to bring new technologies in against a leased portfolio. Said another way, you want to make sure your customers are really, really happy when you have a leased portfolio because the friction of changing gets a little bit easier. And uh, that's fine with us. Actually, I think that it, it keeps us on our toes and has us leaning in, uh, making sure our products and our services are amongst the best. So uh, leasing has increased over time. Uh, we're happy for it to happen. We, we don't, we're not trying to drive it hard one way or another. Uh, and that's kind of how we got here. Great, thank you. Um, another question, digital and data are buzzwords. How does Intuitive articulate the unique value of digital? Yeah, um, it is entirely true that digital and data are sufficiently uh, high level and overused as to be not meaningful, totally true. <laughs> um, I, I think you have to double click and ask, what, what is it you're trying to do? From uh, a data point of view, uh, as you get sensors and you digitize all the things in the operating room and some opportunities pre and post, uh, it's an overwhelming thing actually for hospitals. It's, it's uh, in, in and of itself not useful to them. So it's the quality of the data and post-processing. Think of it as just tools or apps um, that become meaningful. And so we work on those things. I think there are much less um, uh, high level and much more valuable in the actual implementation than, than folks see. So we start simply with uh, 
gathering and, and curating large data sets to make sure that, that we have good data. And then we work hard on validating insights through that work. Um, that provides them tools. Uh, I think we, are, we can generate value with these software tools or apps or software programs or algorithms, however you want to describe them, uh, in a bunch of different ways. And I shared with you some of them. Some of those, for example, accessing a preoperative image of a 3D model of a lung that you had uh, taken before the case but not used, we can charge for directly. There's value that on a per case basis or on a subscription basis, customers recognize. There are other things that are cost avoidance for the hospital and for us that, uh, that reduce the friction of everything, and, and we'll do that too. So we evaluate our, our data and digital investments and our tools to look at both of those opportunities. We see opportunity for both. And uh, it's not theoretical for us. I think they're deployed in the field, they're being adopted, and we're quite excited about it. Thank you. Um, another question, you are trading at 10 plus X to revenue and announced a stock buyback yesterday. Rationale? We, <clears throat> with regard to uh, share repurchase, uh, we run a process that's uh, disciplined and has been uh, the same process we've had for years. And that is we have a strong team internally uh, that, that looks at what we think the value of our company is over the long term, understanding what our, what our plans and perspectives are. We validate that with external resources and, and bankers. We have a uh, committee of our board who are financial experts who are quite good. And uh, routinely, we review where we think uh, the stock price is relative to what we think the inherent value over time, over a, over a, a multi-year time horizon, and where we think there's an opportunity for return of cash through buybacks to shareholders is a good long-term uh, investment. We do it. And, and that's been our history. Uh, there are other folks who do buybacks differently. Some folks will do a regular heartbeat, just buy back a little bit. Um, it has an anti-dilutional effect. You know, we have an employee stock plan that creates some dilution over time. So when we see these opportunities, it, it, uh, it gives a chance to, to reduce the share count, which benefits those who want to stay in intuitive as shareholders. And uh, so nothing new. Um, we don't do it for the press. We don't do it for a press release. We don't do it to signal confidence to shareholders as we're, we're looking at it as a long-term investment of capital that uh, will help the long-term shareholders of the company. Great, thank you. A um, Couple of quick other ones. Uh, how do you describe what separates you from the others in the market? Um, you know, in the early days, they thought we were crazy. Uh, they thought that our products would die of their own ugliness, and they waited. <laughs> um, that's not where everybody is these days. Uh, where everybody is now, I think, is they go, hey, this kind of concept of uh, a tech-enabled ecosystem that can be well-delivered, that's data-backed, uh, with a team that can deliver it into the, into the operating room, that, that feels pretty good. So I, I don't think that's under debate anymore. And the reason is not because we were compelling orders. The reason is that our customers have voted with their feet and they have told uh, other players in the market, if you want to participate, you're going to have to provide something like this. So I, I don't think it's a big mystery. Now I think the real question is um, who can deliver and, and deliver uh, these products that have very high reliability, that do what they're expected to do, and that people want to use, uh, that, that want to enjoy. And, um, and that's what drives us. Uh, we have a very capable product realization, product design, human factors team, and our uh, supply chains and our manufacturing skills are quite good. And to do those things, I think, uh, as this gets bigger, we'll have to satisfy customer need with products they want to use that are routinely reliable and hit the right price points, and others will try to do the same. Great, thank you. And I think this, this last question is a good one to end on. Um, how do you see healthcare changing 20 years from now, and how will this affect patient care? Um, the opportunity for, as I started earlier in the talk, uh, so I, I'm a, an applied math background. Um, as you dig in and dig in and dig in, if, if you're kind of curious about the health data, go read the papers and sit with the customers carefully. It's uh, the, the amount of opportunity is just staggering to do better. Um, Ten years ago, you'd sit with a C-suite and say, show me the data about how your programs are running. Have you assessed or, or have you analyzed the variability of care delivery in your own hands? And almost no C-suites of hospitals had done that. So two out of ten will have sent 
smart MBAs into the bowels of the ship to see what they're actually delivering. I was shocked. I was shocked. And what they would come back and say to us is, you know, that's interesting technology, but it costs too much and it takes too long. And we would say, well, let's go look at the data. Is that true? Is that true? Let's go see. And they wouldn't have the data. It was, it was mythology. It wasn't grounded. Today, uh, as a result of a huge amount of investments folks have made in electronic medical records, there is some data to go make that set of assessments. So I'm thankful for the uh, EMR uh, evolution that has happened. It's not perfect data. It's not actually designed to measure all the things we would hope for it to measure. But it's something uh, it can be analyzed, and it started to train the field to go ask these questions and answer them using, using data and statistics, which is great. But so what does that mean? I think a lot of the things, as I walk the halls here, a huge amount of what folks are working on are um, integrated product lines that, that have data as a, at the very least as an asset that can be brought along with the, with the implementation. I think that you'll see data-based implementation be ubiquitous. Uh, I think all of us have to drive variability out. Um, if, you, if you look at total cost of care, an enormous part of the cost of care in acute environments, I, I'm not expert in, in at-home treatment and I'm not expert in, in chronic disease management, but in acute care environments, the enormous amount of the expense is due to um, downside variability of these care teams. And if you can find it, if you can design products that help ameliorate it, if you can design systems that help people identify where they are on that continuum before they get into an operating room in an acute care environment, I think you'll make a huge change. I think there's two decades of opportunity for that. Um, I think the lines between diagnostics, robotics, manual, and cloud computing are arbitrary and they'll start to be erased. I think what these things look like, um, We'll start, you'll start to see categories cross over, and that's an opportunity for value creation, which is, I think, exciting. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gary, for your, uh, your, your comments there. Really fascinating approach to uh, the kind of ecosystem approach to thinking about um, operations and the training of the team.